Norway is the black sheep of the Scandinavian football family. Whereas Sweden have competed in 12 World Cups, reaching four semi-finals and one final, and Denmark have been regulars at the Euros and the World Cup since the 1980s, and have even won the Euros, Norway have only ever qualified for four major tournaments, where they won a grand total of just three games. In fairness to Norway, its climate, particularly in the north, tends to be less hospitable for playing football than Denmark's, and its population is half the size of Sweden's. Norway is home to fewer than 5.5 million people, and football faces severe competition from other popular pastimes such as skiing, alcoholism, and performing in heavy metal bands. In 2018 World Cup qualifying, Norway lost 6-0 against Germany and 1-0 against Azerbaijan. Other memorable lowlights included defeats against Montenegro, Estonia and Belarus, and at their very lowest ebb, just six years ago, Norway ranked 87th in the FIFA World Rankings, below the likes of Congo, Cape Verde and the Faroe Islands, a Danish archipelago of just 50,000 people. They say that the darkest hour comes right before the dawn though, and so it's seen for Norway. In 2019, Erling Haaland made his international debut at the age of 19, linking up with a 20-year-old Martin Erdegaard, who made his own international debut for Norway, aged only 15. Last season, Haaland and Erdegaard were arguably the two best players of the two best clubs in the best league in all of world football. Haaland scored 52 goals in 53 games to inspire Manchester City to a historic treble, which was almost enough to win him the Ballon d'Or. Meanwhile, Erdegaard topped Arsenal's own scoring charts and won the club's Player of the Season award, as the Gunners enjoyed their best Premier League campaign in almost 20 years. Complemented by the likes of Christopher Ayer, Leo Erstegaard, Frederick Ersnes, and even more recently, Antonio Nusa and Oscar Bob, some have described Norway's current crop of players as a golden generation, capable of going further at major tournaments than any Norway team that came before them. In reality, what has actually happened, so far at least, is that Norway have just failed to even qualify for their 12th successive major tournament. The last time that Norway competed in a major tournament, namely Euro 2000, Erling Haaland still hadn't been born. Norway's most recent failure, confirmed over the current international break, came after they finished third behind Spain and Scotland in their qualifying group, with just three wins from eight matches, and they were denied even of a route into the playoffs after finishing below Serbia in their 2022-23 UEFA Nations League group. Following an expanded format, the Euros now consist of 24 teams out of UEFA's 55 member associations. Teams who have already qualified for Euro 2024 include the likes of Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania and Albania, with three more teams from the playoffs still to join them. And still, Norway, with two world-class players and a supposed golden generation, are nowhere to be found. It all begs the question, what on earth is going on? Or, more precisely, why is Norway's current team, held in such high regard on paper, quite so bad in real life? Well, that's what today's video is all about. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Norway, a land of spectacular fjords, breathtaking mountains, and intelligent allocation of North Sea oil revenue, Britain would never, as we take a look at Norway's so-called golden generation, why it isn't very good, and what could be done to fix it. It's all well and good having two world-class players, but football is a team sport, consisting of nine other players in a starting eleven, and a further twelve in an international squad. That is probably the most common justification for Norway's lack of success. In short, Haaland and Erdegaard might be great, but everyone else isn't very good. So let's scrutinise that argument. There can be no doubt that Haaland and Erdegaard are the two stars of this Norway team, as they would be in the vast majority of national teams, but Norway have several players who would start for a handful of teams who have qualified for Euro 2024 and other recent tournaments. Frederik Ersnes, formerly of Feyenoord and now at Benfica, has been superb since his 2022 move to Portugal and is among the most versatile players in any of Europe's major leagues. Capable of playing, quite literally, 
anywhere on the pitch, Ursnes has rapidly established himself as a firm fan favourite in Lisbon, thanks to his leadership, work rate and selflessness. He is also quite good at football, smart, good on the ball and excellent in the pass, which, you know, is always a useful bonus. Then you've got fullback or wingback Julian Ryerson, who joined Borussia Dortmund from Union Berlin almost a year ago, former Trabzonspor star Alexander Sorloff, a 6 foot 5 inch man mountain who is among the leading scorers in La Liga so far this season with Villarreal, Napoli centre back Leo Ostergaard, Bodo Glimp star man Patrick Berg, Brentford's Christopher Ayer, AS Roma's Ola Solbakken, who is currently on loan at Olympiacos, and Celta Vigo's Jorgen Strand Larsson, who, like Sorloth, has also made a flying start this season in La Liga. That's a core of nine players, horribly pronounced, but nine players nonetheless, all competing, and currently flourishing, at the highest level in Europe. And they are aided by the enormously talented young duo of Club Bruges' Antonio Nusa and Manchester City's Oscar Bob, perhaps soon to be joined by Benfica's Andreas Scheldrup and Ajax's Sivert Mansvak. Norway, therefore, are not, or at least, they certainly shouldn't be a two-man team. There is no doubt, in my mind at least, that Norway have a more talented squad than several teams that have enjoyed greater success in recent years, including a number of those heading to Euro 2024. Even if we were to accept that the Norway team, barring Haaland and Erdegaard, was no more than mediocre though, which I don't think is true, the impact of star power is perennially understated in football. Sure, Football is a team sport in which the whole is often greater than the sum of its parts, but when some of those parts are truly great, it can make one hell of a difference. Inter Miami makes for an interesting case study in this regard. Inter Miami were rubbish in Major League Soccer this season. They finished 14th out of 15 teams in the Eastern Conference and 27th out of 29 teams in the league as a whole. But following the arrival of Lionel Messi, arguably still the single most talented footballer on the planet, Miami were a team transformed. They won the League's Cup up against the best teams from MLS and Liga MX, as Messi scored in every single one of Miami's seven games and scored twice in three of them. In the semi-finals, Miami beat Philadelphia Union 4-1, having lost 4-1 against them in Major League Soccer just two months earlier, before Messi arrived. Inter Miami have lost just one game in which Messi has started since his arrival, yet in the eight games that he has missed through injury since joining the club, Miami returned to their old ways, with a record of just one win, three draws, and four defeats, including a 4-1 defeat against Chicago Fire, which believe me, takes some doing. That's a very high profile and recent example, but the best examples of the power of the individual in football actually come in the international game, and are therefore even more relevant to Norway. Wales had never qualified for the Euros, and hadn't qualified for the World Cup in 64 years, before Gareth Bale, the sole world-class player in a modest Wales squad, dragged them kicking and screaming to Euro 2016 and Euro 2020, followed by the 2022 World Cup. Wales didn't just qualify for the Euros though, in 2016, they made it all the way through to the semi-finals, famously beating Belgium's golden generation 3-1 in the quarters. Bale scored seven goals in Euro 2016 qualifying, whilst no one else scored more than twice for Wales. At the tournament proper, only Antoine Griezmann scored more goals than him. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, likewise, spent more than a decade as Sweden's talisman, becoming the country's all-time leading goalscorer. Ibrahimovic was Sweden's top scorer as they reached the quarterfinals of Euro 2004 and their top scorer in pretty much every one of their qualifying campaigns for the next decade. In Euro 2016 qualifying, Ibrahimovic scored 11 goals. Sweden's next highest goalscorer was Erkan Zengin with three. In the playoffs, Ibrahimovic scored another three goals, three of Sweden's four in fact, in a 4-3 aggregate win against Scandinavian rivals Denmark, almost single-handedly securing qualification for his team. Robert Lewandowski scored almost all of Poland's goals in Euro 2016, 2018 World Cup, 
Euro 2020 and 2022 World Cup qualifying, and he was the highest scorer of any nationality in two of those qualifying campaigns. Gabon have qualified for the AFCON more times since Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang made his debut in 2009 than they had in their entire history up to that point. Senegal qualified for both the 2018 and 2022 World Cups, as well as reaching the AFCON final in 2019 and being crowned continental champions for the very first time in 2021, thanks largely to the individual brilliance of Sadio Mane. And Liberia had never even qualified for the African Cup of Nations before George Weah came along, helping them qualify in 1996 and again in 2002. Of course, the likes of Wales, Sweden and Poland had, or still have, some talented players, aside from Bale, Ibrahimovic and Lewandowski, but so too did Norway, aside from Haaland, and arguably none of those three had a better second player than Erdegaard. One of the problems for Norway, if you have watched them during this qualifying campaign, has been the prevalence of players playing out of position, or at least, outside of their favoured positions. Alexander Soloff and Jorgen Strand Larsen should be two of Norway's most important players, but they are 6 foot 4 inch and 6 foot 5 inch centre forwards. And as you probably know, Norway already have quite a good 6 foot 4 inch centre forward who likes to play through the middle on his own. Whenever Haaland is fit, naturally, he starts, meaning Soloff and Larsen are either dropped or forced out wide. They can do a job on the wing, sometimes, but it's not where either of them really want to be, and it severely blunts the effectiveness of two of Norway's better players. Likewise, 6 foot 6 inch Christopher Eyer has often found himself starting games at right back, a position which he can play in, but he is really a centre back. Mohamed Al Yanoussi is frequently shifted from the right to the left flank and then back again, and Sander Berg has been played on the wing despite being a central midfielder. None of these in of themselves, are particularly problematic. They should all be able to do a job in those positions. But when you combine them all, along with the fact that, particularly in defence, a number of Norway's defenders, fullbacks and wingbacks, are more used to playing in a back three or back fives than in back fours at club level, and it creates a sense of disjointedness and particularly defensive uncertainty. Some of those issues are the inevitable consequence of how unbalanced squads in international football can be, and the inevitable desire to play as many of your best players as possible, but others have been firmly laid at the door of national team boss Stahl Solbakken. Viewed as a real coup by the Norwegian Football Federation when they first appointed him in December 2020, following the resignation of previous head coach Lars Lagerbeck, Solbakken enjoyed tremendous success during 12 and a half years, split between two separate stints, managing FC Copenhagen. In that time, Solbakken won eight Danish Superliga titles and four Danish Cups, establishing Copenhagen as the dominant force in Danish football. That only tells half the story, though. Sandwiched in between Solbakken's very long and trophy-laden spells with Copenhagen were two distinctly shorter and less successful stints, managing outside of Denmark. The first came with Cologne, who Solbakken managed to relegate, despite the fact that the club had finished 10th the previous season, and had Lukas Podolski on their books, who scored 18 goals in the Bundesliga that season. Following a car crash campaign involving several off-field incidents, Solbakken was swiftly sacked, later claiming that neither Jesus Christ nor Jose Mourinho would have been able to keep Cologne up in the same circumstances. Incidentally, before joining Cologne in the summer of 2011, Solbakken had agreed to take the Norway job in six months' time, but Cologne bought out his contract with the national team for €400,000. It didn't take long for them to wish that they'd kept a receipt. Next up was Wolverhampton Wanderers, who appointed Solbakken after a three-year stint in the Premier League had come to an end. Wolves retained the core of their Premier League squad in the Championship and most of their highest earners, as well as backing Solbakken in the transfer market, and they were installed as the third favourites to win promotion from the Championship that season. Following a fairly positive start though, when Solbakken was sacked in January, Wolves had won just one of their last 16 games and sat 18th in the championship table, just six points above the relegation zone. What's more, for all of Solbakken's success at Copenhagen, it is worth noting that 
He routinely had by far the largest budget in the division, and in his last season, Copenhagen finished second, some nine points behind Midtjylland. Since his departure, Copenhagen have regained the Danish Superliga title in each of the last two seasons under Jess Thorup and Jacob Niestrup, and this season, they are not only top of the Superliga once again, but are currently second in their Champions League group, ahead of Manchester United and Galatasaray, following a 4-3 win against the former in their last fixture. It is certainly arguable, therefore, that Solbakken failed at both Cologne and at Wolves, and even at Copenhagen, where he was very successful, they have improved since he left. Entrusted with Norway's most gifted group of players at least since the 1990s, when Norway reached two World Cups and a Euros, if not of all time, it is hard to see how exactly Solbakken, three years into the job, has left any kind of imprint or made any meaningful improvements to this team. Tactically, it's stale, he is slow to react to things during games, and his substitutions can seem perplexing at times. Solbakken has also developed something of a reputation for absolving himself of responsibility and of washing his hands with Norway's failures. When you look at teams that have qualified for Euro 2024, who are no stronger, I would suggest, than Norway on paper, the importance of having the right person in charge is extremely evident. Take Scotland, for example, from Norway's own qualifying group. Scotland hadn't qualified for a major tournament in over 20 years when Steve Clark was appointed manager in May 2019. From day one, though, it has been very clear what Clark has been trying to do. Scotland were shipping far too many goals when Clark arrived, and indeed, in his own first few games, but since then, they have been very tight, compact, and effective on the break. On Clark's watch, Scotland have kept clean sheets against the likes of England, Denmark and Spain, qualifying for both Euro 2020 via the playoffs, and Euro 2024 even more emphatically, after finishing as runners-up in their group. Clark got the Scotland job off the back of taking a Kilmarnock team that was fighting relegation all the way up to third in the Scottish Premiership, qualifying for Europe for the first time in nearly 20 years. In some ways, it was the perfect preparation for the Scotland job. Kilmarnock were plucky underdogs, whose success was built on an outstanding defensive unit, and who became extremely effective in getting points against Scotland's biggest teams. Kilmarnock beat Celtic 2-1 at home, and they drew both league games against Rangers. Clark, therefore, was well-versed in the pragmatic demands of coaching a team, who would at times be favourites, but would often have to ride out heavy storms. Solbakken, by contrast, had only ever failed when that was required of him, at Cologne and with Wolves, and with Copenhagen, he had the biggest budget and the best players, and was expected to win every game, which clearly isn't the nature of the Norway job. Marco Rossi with Hungary's national team is another good example. One of the best national team bosses in Europe, at least as far as I'm concerned, Rossi has taken a Hungary team that is light on superstars and has made them incredibly difficult to beat. In Euro 2024 qualifying, Hungary didn't lose a single game. Meanwhile, Rossi has masterminded impressive victories against England and Germany, and a one-all draw against France. In most of the world, when a manager doesn't get results, they are immediately put under immense pressure. But not just with the Norwegian Football Federation, but all of the Scandinavian FAs, it seems at times as though there is a more relaxed attitude around failure. Sweden have only had three managers in the last 23 years, and none of them were sacked, they all resigned of their own volition. Lars Lagerbeck resigned after failing to qualify for the 2010 World Cup, rather than being dismissed. Eric Hamren chose to step down following a group stage exit at Euro 2016. And Jana Andersson just resigned following Sweden's failure to qualify for Euro 2024. Denmark, likewise, have had just four managers since 1996, a period of 27 years, only one of whom, Martin Olsen, was actually sacked, and even that was only after he had already announced his intention to step down after 15 years in the job. 
Norway, who have had much less success in recent years than either Sweden or Denmark, appear to be just as lacking in urgency and ambition. In May 2023, fresh off the back of three games without a win, including a one-all draw with Georgia, which significantly dented Norway's Euro 2024 qualifying hopes, the Norwegian Football Federation rewarded Star Solbakken with a two-year contract extension, with a further one-year optional extension. It is hard to imagine too many other countries in Europe, with Norway's player pool and recent results, doing likewise in those same circumstances. The only person applying any significant pressure on Solbakken would appear to be the man himself, who has promised to step down if Norway don't qualify for the 2026 World Cup. Norway's struggles, most assuredly, cannot be laid at the door of just one man, though. One of the biggest complaints among Norwegians is that, for all of their gifted and intricate attacking players, they lack any horrible and nasty defenders or offensive midfielders, and are particularly light at centre-back, and there are some interesting theories as to why that might be the case. Historically, Norwegians were often considered to be hardened professionals, toughened up by Norway's brutal climate, and culturally similar to the British, at least in terms of their love of a crunching tackle and industrious running, almost as much, as a mazy dribble or delicate finish. Over the last couple of decades, though, Norway's frozen and waterlogged grass pitches have been almost wholly replaced by more practical and easier to maintain artificial surfaces. That has allowed Norwegian teams to focus on the technical aspects of their game all year round, and that is exactly what they've done. Norway's artificial turf revolution has coincided with a wider push within coaching, not limited to Norway, but certainly very prevalent there, for a hyper-focus on touch, dribbling, skill, and other more technical aspects of the game, rather than tackles, interceptions, or aerial duels. The end result is that those players who are less technically gifted, but might have made for very robust and intelligent centre-backs, are weeded out of the academy system very early on, and don't go on to have careers within the game. There is no going back in terms of the artificial pitches, Norway's climate dictates that, but on the coaching front, there are significant calls now for rondos, passing and dribbling drills to at least be accompanied by more varied coaching methods that help to hone players who are perhaps less in the mould of a Martin Erdegaard and more akin to someone like Henning Berg. Once again though, Norwegian football just seems to sort of trundle along, slow to react or implement genuine change. Norway doesn't even have a national training centre for its football teams, which seems odd for a country with such vast resources, where football is, despite competition from winter sports, still by far the most popular sport. The existence of Haaland and Erdegaard, two stars in the Premier League, a league which Norwegians consume and adore as if it were their own, combined with the relative success of teams like Molde and Bodo Glimt in Europe, ought to provide the launch pad for a serious mentality shift in Norwegian football, but in action, threatens to throw that opportunity away. Given the stars in Norway's midst, most international football fans would be surprised to discover just how pessimistic the atmosphere and general mood surrounding the national team in Norway is. Norwegians have a reputation for being reserved, and not the most flamboyantly enthusiastic at times regardless, but even before this latest setback, in terms of failing to qualify for Euro 2024, the mood was distinctly sombre. This isn't the first time that Norway have had a talented group of players touted to go further than ever before, and there is a sense in which, whilst the international community might look at Haaland, Erdegaard and co and get excited, Norwegians feel as though they have seen this all before. It doesn't seem to matter about personnel when it comes to the Norway team. As soon as they pull on that shirt, they become choke merchants. When it matters most, Norway have an almost unique ability to not turn up. There is almost an acceptance now that this is just part and parcel of Norwegian DNA, and there is no point in getting your hopes up just for them to be knocked down. That kind of thing can be very difficult to shake, but if Norway are to turn their fortunes around, their players will have to find it within them to do it. It is worth noting that, though Norway's problems are primarily of their own making, they have had some misfortune along the way. Their Euro 2024 qualifying group, for instance, was a tough one, pitted against Spain and Scotland. 
Had Norway been drawn in Group I, for example, where the top two teams are Romania and Switzerland, there is naturally a much greater chance that they would have qualified. Whilst far from the greatest victims of the conflict, they were also somewhat screwed over by Russia's early 2022 full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Because Russia were suspended by UEFA, they decided that all games against the bottom place teams in UEFA Nations League League B groups would be entirely void. Two of Norway's three wins came against last place Sweden, so the cruel rule change denied them of a playoff spot, which would at least have given them a second chance to qualify for the Euros, despite finishing below Spain and Scotland. Norway have also had some really poor fortune when it comes to injuries. Most notably of all, Erling Haaland's injury in March, ahead of key games for Norway against Spain and Georgia, from which they ended up taking just one point, came as an enormous blow. Haaland has scored a remarkable 27 goals from just 29 caps for Norway, mirroring his goal-scoring record at club level, but the Spain and Georgia games aren't the only fixtures that he has missed. Since making his international debut, Haaland has missed 12 games, or roughly a third, of Norway's matches through injury, which is an awful lot of football for the nation's main man. Strange as it may seem to some, Haaland also has a slightly mixed public perception in Norway. On the one hand, he is already probably the country's greatest player of all time, age 23, but on the other hand, Haaland's travel by private jet, personal bodyguards, and Rolls Royces put him at odds with some Norwegian ideals. Former Liverpool fullback John Arnorisa had a similar disaffection, his flash lifestyle viewed as being somehow a Norwegian. There's a word for it, Jantelerven, or the law of Jant in English, coined by the Danish-Norwegian author Axel Sandemos. It's now used colloquially to describe a social attitude of disapproval towards expressions of individuality and personal success. Basically, this is a country that doesn't do superstars, and when it does, it still doesn't like to make too much of a fuss about them. Oslo isn't plastered with posters or murals of Haaland, like Cairo is with Mohamed Salah, or in Seoul with Son Hyung min Haaland's ties to the UAE through his employment at Manchester City, environmental considerations over his private jet usage, and various sponsorship deals have also been treated with a degree of suspicion. There have even been questions asked about the extent to which Haaland has been injured when he has missed games, as was often the case with Ryan, Giggs and Wales. This weekend, for example, despite missing both of Norway's games over the international break, few would be surprised to see Haaland start for Man City in their Premier League fixture against Liverpool. Back in June, Haaland was even booed by Norway fans for refusing to sign autographs following defeat against Scotland. There is some good news for Norway. For a start, their squad is still young. Haaland, Ostergaard, and Strand Larsson are 23, Erdegaard is 24, Oscar Bob and Antonio Nusa are 20 and 18, and there are several promising Norwegian youngsters still yet to make their senior international debuts. I can remember, over a decade ago, when Belgium failed to qualify for Euro 2012, despite having the likes of Hazard, De Bruyne, Witzel, Company, and Courtois in their ranks, there were those who questioned whether they ever would, but that was just the start of the journey for those players, who soon became tournament regulars and finished third at the 2018 World Cup. Norway's squad isn't as talented as Belgium's was then, and reaching the semi-finals of a World Cup seems like a long shot. But they should, at the very least, qualify for the next couple of Euros. So, how can they make that happen? Well, first and foremost, they need to shake off 20 years of failure. And if that means freshening up the squad and, almost certainly, I would suggest, a change of head coach, then so be it. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, who has been out of work for two years since getting sacked by Manchester United, is reported to be one candidate. And I think that Norway could certainly do a lot worse. Harshly criticised at times at Old Trafford, Solskjaer showed himself to be a talented motivator who can create a good team spirit, which is so crucial in international football, whilst also knowing how to set a team up to get results in big games against stronger opponents. Norway needs a national training centre to enact shifts in coaching practices that everyone in the Norwegian game seems to acknowledge need to happen, and a football federation that can provide the ambition to match the talent of Norway's players. 
Norway's women's team are much more competitive than the men's, having qualified for every single Women's World Cup, all but one Women's Euros, and ranked 13th in the world, compared to the men's team, who currently rank 42nd. But even with the women's team, there have been serious questions asked of the Football Federation. Ada Hergeberg, Norway's star player and a Ballon d'Or winner in 2018, refused to represent the national team from 2017 to 2022 due to the way that the federation treated women's football. Lastly, it must be noted that several of Norway's star players at big clubs like Borussia Dortmund, Napoli and Sevilla weren't getting regular game time at club level at the start of this qualification cycle, but they are now, and that alone is likely to be a huge boost for the national team moving forward. It will take more than that for Norway to start fulfilling their potential though, and taking advantage of the enormous opportunities that now present themselves to them. It would be a crying shame to see that wasted, and there is quite frankly no way that this team shouldn't at the very least be qualifying for the Euros. That is it for today's video, which I inexplicably chose to end with the worst Norway joke out there. I can only apologise. But I hope that you enjoyed the rest of it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, it goes without saying, make sure that you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armour, both of which should be on or about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, should you wish to do so. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.